Good morning. Thank you for being here this morning. We are glad to have a large group here in-house as y'all come in and find seats. We are sitting socially distanced and wearing our masks and doing all we can to make this a healthy environment for everybody. I know there's lots of folks that are joining us online, and we sure do appreciate y'all joining us as well. A couple of updates on our prayer list, some things we need to, to make you aware of. We certainly want to extend our sympathy to the family of Donald Stone. Donald had a heart procedure and uh, had some complications from that and passed away on Friday night. That funeral will be later this week. We'll update you as soon as we have more information about that. But we want to remember Gloria and the Springer and Nunez families in our prayers as well. We also want to extend our sympathy to David Witter on the loss of his dad, Leo Witter. He passed away last week, and Leo's funeral will be tomorrow in Illinois. Also on our prayer list, Terry Thomas is home with shingles. And uh, Hallie Hanley fell and broke her wrist. I got the sisters confused, and Emmy's in the bulletin. She's doing great. But uh, Hallie, on the other hand, has a cast on her wrist. Please keep Hallie in your prayers. And we've also been asked to remember Latravian Taylor. This is a 13-year-old boy from here in Henderson. He is at Riley's Children's Hospital with COVID right now. So please keep him in your prayers. Those are all the updates on our prayer list that I've got. Uh, there is a, a mystery secret sister gift in the lobby. If you know the identity of that secret sister gift, please let me know or let the office know. And uh, we are still looking for pictures for our website. If you have some congregational pictures and deacons, we do need to get an update from you with a picture of you and your family, a short bio, just three or four sentences about you, and then your area of responsibility. Those are all the updates I've got for our announcements this morning. Leading us in our worship service, Micah Busby will have our opening prayer. Brian Maddox is going to be our song leader this morning. This is Brian's last Sunday with us. He's headed down to Mississippi to join Casey and the kids and begin his practice there. And we are grateful for all that Brian and his family have done for us and meant to us, and we're going to miss them a lot, but we'll keep in touch. And uh, Josh Terry will have our Lord's Supper devotional, Juan Nunez will have our scripture reading, I'll have our sermon, and Rodney Newton will have our closing prayer. If there's nothing further, Brian, let's begin our worship service. I will praise the Lord all my life, I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. I will praise the Lord all my life, I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this good day. We could be together with one another to worship you and sing these songs of praise to you. Father, we're so thankful for all the wonderful blessings you've given us, for we know they all come from your hands. Father, we are so thankful for our church family, and dear Lord, we continue to pray for our elders and the decisions they have to make, and please be with all the deacons and all the works that we do, and pray that all that we do will bring you glory and continue to so thankful for all each and every church member and 
thankful for the opportunities we have to serve you. Father, we're so thankful we have this avenue of prayer that we can give you thanks for all the wonderful blessings and come to you in our times of need. So thankful that you are one and true living God. And so thankful for the comfort that we have, knowing that you hold the whole world in your hands. To Lord, we're so thankful for, for we have a Savior in your Son, Jesus. I'm grateful for that example he was to each of us. Father, we continue to pray for those on our prayer list. We ask that you be with them, help them to feel better. Dear Lord, we also want to remember those who lost loved ones. Please be with the family of David Whitter, Whitter and the loss of his dad. We just ask you comfort them. Father, we want to remember the family of Donald Stone. And please be with Gloria and all her family. We ask that you help comfort them during their time of loss. Father, we love you, and we say our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Come thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all glorious, for all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou in power. sacrifice. Uh, so if you have your communion cups, you'll notice that uh, there are two sides. I ask that you open the side with the bread on it. Go ahead and peel back that top layer. In the letter to the church at Galatia, Paul writes these words in chapter 4. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the day set by his father. So it's very interesting that we see, especially in ancient Jewish culture, uh, we see someone, a child, being treated as, quote unquote, a slave. Uh, they own everything. They have the inheritance to everything. And yet, they're looked at as the same as the help. In fact... Many times, uh, a manager of the house would be put over in charge of them and would tell them what to do. And even though, in truth, one day this manager would be owned by this young individual on the day that is set by his father, he was still in charge of him for a time being. And I think that's very interesting that Paul's drawing this here because what Paul's talking about is being a slave to the old law, to the law itself. Uh, if you have your Bibles and want to continue along with me, he continues to write, In the same way, we also, when we're, we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the, fullness of time had com when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. What does that mean? What's so important about that? Well, it's really interesting, actually, because a slave doesn't get to sit at the table and eat with dad. A slave doesn't get called to Sunday dinner and say, hey, we're going to be joined together here. A slave does not get to partake of the sacrifice. And that's why we're called slaves to sin, slaves to the world, slaves to the old law. 
But because of the time that God sent his son for our sacrifice, for, for the sacrifice of our sins on the cross, we are asked to become heirs. We get to sit at the table. We get to eat the food. And at that time, that's what we're doing now. We're remembering that sacrifice. And we're sitting at this table. So let's go ahead and have a prayer for the bread. God, we're so thankful for this wonderful blessing of, of being heirs with you. Lord, as we uh, partake of this bread, let us remember the sacrifice that it was given as your son was hung upon Calvary's cross. We ask that uh, we do this in a manner that's pleasing in your sight. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. So a modern day example of a slave that is over, you got to bear with me, this is a little nerdy, a slave that is over his master is Alfred from Batman. If you think about it, Bruce Wayne is in charge of Alfred, but he's a little kid and Alfred raises him and, and teaches him things that his father would teach him. In the same way we see that after Bruce Wayne becomes Batman. He puts on this mantle, this new honor. He still respects Alfred, but it is now Batman who makes the choices. Alfred is Batman's sidekick. In the same way, bear with me, the law is something that we still know. We still read it. We still research it. We have our Old Testaments, and it's good for us to learn from it. But it's this new law, this new faith, this new love that we get to wear in honor. I know that was a little geeky of an analogy, but I liked it. So at this time, if you want to remove that second layer and open up the fruit of the vine, we'll have a prayer for it. Our Father in heaven, God, we're so thankful for the blessing of this cup where we get to celebrate with you the, the sacrifice, the freedom that we feel, the honor that you have bestowed upon us to be your sons, your Christians, your, your people. Father, we're so blessed. As we take of this fruit of the vine, we pray that we do so in remembrance of your son and his sacrifice. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. In your pew, there should be a little Ziploc baggie for you to uh, dispose of the trash in. So go ahead and be doing that at this time. So on the first day of the week, we've been asked to give back uh, to set apart something that uh, we want to contribute. And since we're not passing the plate anymore, there are boxes conveniently located at the back of the auditorium uh, in order for you to drop your contribution in there. Let's go ahead and have a, a prayer for the offering. Our Father in heaven, God, we're so blessed. We're greatly blessed in this world to have the jobs and the freedoms that we have. We ask that you be with us, that you strengthen us, Lord, as we give back. We pray that it strengthens this church and strengthens your kingdom to, to be people that are willing to, to sacrifice and give to you in your cause. God, we're so blessed, and we thank you for that. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. Father, he is the Prince of Peace. At the name of 
Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at His name. There is no other name. There is no other name. No name I wish we're saying. This morning's uh, scripture reading will be from the book of Matthews, chapter 7, verses 24, 25. Therefore, whoever hears these saying of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and in it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Thank you, Juan, for reading that. Thank you for being here this morning. It is great to see folks here. And again, I know we have several folks that join us online. We get updates from them each week, and uh, we are glad that we're able to do that as well. We've been talking on Sunday mornings about a new normal, which is kind of a phrase we've gotten used to throwing around, but we've talked about it in our spiritual lives and said, you know what, this time of disruption, this time that, that kind of changed everything for us, it, it gave us an opportunity to build our own new normal. And we use the analogy of a yard sale. You go through all this stuff in your house and you look at some of it and you say, I, I used to think that was valuable. I paid full price for that. I bought it. I wanted it. And now it's not really a part of my life anymore. I'm going to get rid of it. And you look at it and you say, I, I don't really want that in my life going forward. And so you get rid of it. And maybe something else you look at and you say, wow, we haven't used this in a long time. But now that I look at it again, boy, I don't want to get rid of that. Send that back to the house. We're keeping that. And that's sort of what we've been doing in our life. We're taking a look at some things. We said, you know, a crisis reveals you. And, and as we've gone through this time of crisis, we learned some things about ourselves and our relationships and our life. And some of those things we said, hey, they're not worth keeping. I want to get rid of them. And others of them, we said, I want to forge a new identity and I want to build that into my new identity. And we talked last week about how in Christ, our identity is received, not achieved. It's based on what God did for me in Christ Jesus. We said the core of our identity ought to be we're a Christian. That ought to form the basis of everything else. And as we get our life back on track, we said, all right, that's the foundation. How do I build a new identity? So this final lesson, we've called it rebuilding. And we said, you know, we used to find our identity in all kinds of things, our, our job, our money, our friends, our grades, our titles, stuff. But we've seen that all those things can collapse. And so we said, hey, when we build our new normal, we want to make sure the stuff we put back in doesn't end up just being some new idols, some new things that will end up mastering us. So we said, let's make sure that the things we keep will end up being a servant, not a master in our life. That, that we look at things and say, you know what, this is good. Money, money is good. Money can be used well, but it makes a terrible master. I don't want to serve it. Friendships and relationships, they're great. God blesses us with the people he puts in our lives. But I don't want to be a servant to that and always chasing after more friends and more popularity and more fame. So let's be sure that what we put back in to our life will last and it will be a servant, not a master to us. You know, one of the things we learned during this time of pandemic is that a lot of things can collapse really quickly. We said, you know what, nobody five years ago got the question right, where do you see yourself in five years? It just didn't happen. Nobody saw this coming. And if you live right here in Henderson, I promise I didn't set up a sermon illustration for this weekend. But if you drive downtown, there's a building that stood... Well, there's a pile of rubble where a building stood since at least 1885. And over the weekend, it collapsed. And we learned, hey, you know, things can collapse. And if you, you can go see the video where they knock it down and, and they try to punch one little hole in the wall and the whole thing just collapses in on itself. 
and we learned, hey, things collapse. And maybe you looked at that video and thought, I, I felt that way. You know, when everything shut down, when they said, hey, my business is, is not essential, and, and I, I watched everything collapse in. Or maybe the longer we stayed at home and, and man, relationships got rough and, and my nerves got frayed and, and you watch things collapse and you know that things collapse. But when things collapse, Jesus doesn't. And that's kind of going to be our, our theme as we wrap up. Jesus had preached the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Lots of great teaching in there. You know, you, you can do a whole sermon series just on the Sermon on the Mount. Anytime you get to saying, you know, I don't know what to study. I, I don't know what to read in my Bible. Go read the Sermon on the Mount. It'll always challenge you, give you some ways to grow. Jesus preached that lesson, and he got to the very end of it. it it's the invitation time, you know, and Jesus has been pretty encouraging. There's a lot of good stuff there, uh, a lot of motivational stuff, a lot of how to live your life. We, we get to what we would say is the invitation, and Jesus Jesus got pretty stern with them. Well, we think of it as a kid's story. In fact, one of the things that I have missed this summer more than anything, and a lot of other stuff anyway, we didn't do VBS this summer. And, and I was supposed to direct 8, 9, and 10-year-old week at camp this year for the first time. We didn't get to go to camp with my little kids this summer. And, and I've missed that. We tell this story like it's a kid's story. But really, it's an explosive story for us as adults. It is a life-changing story. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And you know, we, we all think of the song, we get our building blocks out, we're going to build our house on the rock and all that. But the truth is, it all begins with hearing. And there's a lot of voices to listen to in this world. And it's hard to hear sometimes. There's so many voices at the baptism of Jesus, it, it was the voice of God that said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Why did he have to say that? Because there were a lot of people talking about a lot of different things, a lot of religious voices, and God said, let me clear this up for you. I want you to listen to him. Several times in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you have heard, but I say. You know what Jesus means there? Listen to me. Listen to what I'm teaching you. There's a lot of voices out there, and it's hard with all the noise to hear just one voice, to really focus in. Jesus says, whoever hears these sayings of mine, there, there are blessings in the Sermon on the Mount that we don't want to hear. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, and I think, I don't really want to be a poor in spirit. And he says, blessed are the meek, and I say, I don't know if I want to be meek. He said, blessed are those who mourn, and we say, I hope I don't mourn. He says, blessed are the hungry and thirsty. And we say, well, I'd kind of like to be the well-fed and well-watered. And whenever I hear the words of Jesus and I realize I need to make some changes, there, there's a problem because I don't always want to hear that. I don't like that message. And it's hard to focus on that message when there's so many other voices and some of them say things I really, really like. And Jesus says, I've got to hear his words. Francis Bacon was right. He said, it's not what we eat, but what we digest that makes us strong. It's not what we gain, but what we save that makes us rich. It's not what we read, but what we remember that makes us wise. And it's not what we preach or pray, but what we practice that makes us Christian. You see, there's the rub. When I hear the words of Jesus, what do I do with them? It's hard enough to hear the words of Jesus, but Jesus said, whoever hears and does. And he said, here's a wise man. You know what a wise man does? A wise man sees the truth and changes his behavior. A foolish man sees the truth and says, man, I hope that truth changes before the bill comes due. Here's a pop quiz for you. Somebody comes to you and they said, you know what? That thing you said yesterday with, with some people around and, and, and that, that comment you made, that joke, you told, it really hurt my feelings. What do you do? Somebody said, what, what you said hurt me deeply. A wise person says, I need to change my words. I need to change how I handle that situation. A fool says, well, that sounds like a you problem, not a me problem. The bank says, hey, you're overdrawn. There's no money left because you spent too much. A wise person says, I got to change my spending habits. A fool says, I think I'll get another credit card and handle this problem. You see, a wise person sees the truth and changes themselves. A fool just hopes that somehow, some way, the truth might change. 
Well, why would you do that? Why, you know, why does that make sense? Because it's a whole lot easier to just hope truth changes. Jesus said there's a motivation behind that. Verse 25, the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it didn't fall, for it was founded on the rock. And that's an amazing thing that we need to think about as Christians because the wise man did everything right. He listened to Jesus. He put those words into action in his life. He did everything he was supposed to do. He built his house on the rock. He trusted God. He walked by faith, not by sight. He changed his behavior. And you know what happened to him? The storms came because God never promised him a storm-free life. He did everything he was supposed to do, and it didn't keep the storm away because the storms were always coming. Too many folks treat God like a security blanket. It's easy for our prayers to be, oh, Lord, keep me safe from this and keep me safe from this, and don't let anything bad happen to me or anybody I love. But the storms do come. And if all your faith is built on God, don't let anything bad happen to me. When the storms come, you turn around and say, God, why'd you do that? I thought I could trust you. Here's the wise man who built on the rock. He did what he was supposed to do, and the storms still came. And when the storms come, anything that's not built on the rock will collapse. But if you're wise, your life won't collapse in the storm. Jesus goes on and he says, that everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and the foolish man's house went splat. Oh, sorry. Great was its fall, right? We know how that story ends. The foolish man kept saying, man, I hope the truth changes. I hope the truth changes. And the truth didn't change and everything collapsed around him. Carrie Newoff, who, who is kind of who I got the idea for this series from, tells a story of going to the beach. And it was one of his first times at the beach, the first time his boys had ever been to the beach. And as they got there that day, the tide was just going out and they wanted to build a sand castle. And he said, my boys got into it. We built a sand castle. We built a sand village. We spent all day, hours, building this massive sand establishment. We built a fortress around it. It was amazing. He said, and, and as the day got later, I noticed the tide beginning to come back in. He said, I, I didn't have a lot of experience with that. And I looked at this big sand city we had built. And I thought, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think the waves are going to be able to take this thing out. We, we put in a lot of time and effort. We built this thing. And, and I, I think it's going to stand up to the waves. And he said, they kept getting closer and closer. And I kind of got pulled the boys back and said, come on, let's watch this. And Carrie says, you know what? Three waves. Three waves and the sand was smooth as glass. It was all gone. A day's worth of work. As the tide was coming in, it washed everything away. And he said, I thought about this story. Here's a man who built on the sand. And we usually think of the sand like the seashore in Israel. In the summertime, that clay turns really, really rock hard, and it's difficult to build down to a foundation of bedrock. And it's easy to think, oh, I'm sure this will stand up. I mean, this clay is baked hard, and you build your house on that, and then the wet season comes, and that clay turns to the consistency of pudding, and your house falls apart. You see, sometimes it's easy in the good times to think, oh, this, I'm sure this will stand up. I'm sure this will be fine. I know I could do some hard work about this, but, but we'll just take the easy way, take the shortcut. And when the storms come, it's all gone. When Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. I think that's pretty impressive. Jesus tells this story that we've turned into a kid's song and we think, oh yeah, build your house on the rock, you know. When Jesus said it, people were blown away by it. They said, hey, wait a minute. What he said is not like anything else. They realized Jesus was different. You know what they realized? When everything else collapses, Jesus doesn't. When life falls apart, Jesus is your rock. He's your foundation. So let me ask you, back in March when... The world stopped turning, it felt like, when everything shut down. Well, what collapsed? Well, what fell apart in your life? Today, this is a freebie announcement right in the middle of the sermon. We have a We Care sheet sitting out in the lobby. 
I go in and I used to do those every week and we did those on Sunday night at worship service. I went in and I said, you know what, we've got to have a week hair sheet. It's been too long. Some of y'all have been asking about them. I went in and looked and the last one had March 8th, 2020. You know, one of the things that collapsed when everything hit, man, Sunday night fell apart for us. Well, everything stopped there for a while. We care sheets fell apart for us, and and that's a little thing. What what in your life fell apart? Maybe your income fell apart. Your life changed financially. Maybe it changed socially. You know, all of a sudden, ask our kids what school looked like. Man, it changed dramatically. It's still changing, right? Prayers for all our kids and our teachers that are headed back into class this week, virtually anyway. What changed? What fell apart? Maybe make that personal. What came crashing down in your life? And the truth is, maybe it had nothing to do with the pandemic. Maybe you can look back to a time and say, my world fell apart, and it wasn't the virus's fault. My world fell apart the day she walked out. My world fell apart the day the school I'd pinned everything on said, no, I'm sorry, you didn't make the cut. My world fell apart the day they handed out pink slips at work. My work fell apart when that whole group of friends that I thought I knew, and we were all friends, betrayed me. What crashed? You know, we talked about idols last week, the things that we put in place of God, the things we look to for safety and security. And some of those are good. Relationship and family, love and and intimacy, uh, theology, those are good things. You ought to have those in your life. They're all good. Some things like power or control or money, they're not good or bad. It's how you use them. But if you worship them, they all become idols. Let me tell you what happened. When the world changes... Your idols come crashing down. In some way, shape, form, or fashion, they will disappoint you. The things you look to, the things you leaned on will not be there for you. And when they come crashing down, it's because idols always demand more and more. Because even a good thing, a blessing, when it becomes an idol, it becomes a heavy burden. And you can't build your life on something that could be taken away from you. We talked about making that list. Keep and pitch. And we've been working in our, our sermon series. Oh, here's some things I want to get rid of, get out of my life. Things I, I'm going to use this time to really work on getting those out. Some things I want to keep. As you put items on your keep list, how do you make sure you don't build on something that's going to crash later on? That may come crashing down in the next crisis. How do I make sure that what I build on is that rock solid foundation of Jesus? The one who said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Because when blessings become the God or the goal, they become heavy burdens because they always demand more and more and more. We've shared this as well. If I chase after money, how much money do you need? More. If I chase after friends and popularity, how many likes do I need? How many followers do I need? More. If I chase after fame, how much fame do I need? More. Idols are never satisfied. They always demand more and more and more until they bleed you dry because They're never satisfied because they can never satisfy you. The thing you need is Jesus. And idols will never lead you there. They'll never bring you back to the need for a Savior. Chasing after them will never take them the direction you need to actually fill that hole in your life. And and so those things that God intended to be blessings, they become a master. You become addicted to them and chasing after them all the time. But they never satisfy So this morning, I want to give you two questions, two things we can think about as we rebuild our life. First off, what do you want the story of your life to be? When people sit down and tell the story of you, when your family tells the story of you, and hey, here's here's who he was, here's who she was, what do you want the story of your life to be? What do you want the preacher to say at your funeral? What do you want people to remember about you? What do you hope that those closest to you will tell when they tell stories about you. What do you want your life to be like? What do you want to mark your life? And so the second question is, what will get you there? If I'm going to rebuild my life during this disruption, I've had time to think. I've gained a little clarity. Crisis reveals me. I've I've seen, hey, the the, the kingdom without a king, this works-based chasing after everything doesn't, doesn't save me. It will crush me. And I've learned that my identity is received, not achieved. I want to be a Christian. So what's going to take me there? And it's really not a what, it it ought to be a who, right? Because the answer is Jesus. 
And that may sound simple, and it is. It's just not easy. You say, man, I, I learned. I've got some real temper issues. Who's going to help you with your temper? It's going to be Jesus. Put more Jesus in your life. I guarantee if you let all your decisions flow out of that decision, you say, you know what? I, I had some problems. I, I put my faith in a lot of things. I trusted in money, and, man, my money just disappeared during all this. What do I do in the future? Put Jesus in that spot in your heart where you put your trust. And when you say, I don't know what to do next, fill it up with more Jesus. Spend time in the Word of God. Read about Jesus. Study about Jesus. Learn about Jesus. Spend time in prayer. Because when all of your decisions flow out of your identity as a Christian, you'll make better decisions. You'll build your life on the rock. Because if we're not careful, we'll go through this rebuilding time and we'll just fill our life up with some new stuff and 10 years from now, that's going to fall apart. And we'll be right back in yard sale mode and we'll be selling that at a yard sale. You know what you can't control? You can't control the economy. You can't control your bosses at work. You can't control your kids. That's hard for a parent to say, but you know what? You can't control every decision they'll make. You can't control your friends. All those things are out of your control, but if you put your trust in Jesus, he won't collapse, period. In a new normal, if you build the rock, the foundation of your life is Jesus Christ, it won't collapse. You know, when you decide to build or rebuild, you need to get a building permit. You need to say, here's my intention, here's my plan. And so my challenge for you today is let's get building permits for our life. Let's set out our plan right now. I, I want each of us individually to say, here's my plan for rebuilding. Here's who I want to be. Here's what I want the story of my life to be all about. And I know that more Jesus is going to get me there. That's part of it. And I'll make all the rest of my decisions out of that identity I have in Christ. So I, I'm going to get a building permit. Here's my plan to rebuild my life. Here's what I want. Here's some things I want to add in. Here's some things I want to get rid of. I'm going to rebuild this new normal, this next normal in my life. Here's where I want to go with my life. I, I want to do what God wants me to do. Maybe this morning, maybe what we're talking about for you is new construction. You say, you know what? I, I'm convinced I need to build my life on the Lord. When we sing that song with our kids, we always finish up with, so build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe you say, I need to do that. And it's time to begin. I've never taken that step. I, I like the Bible. I like church. I've read the Bible a little bit. I, I think church people are good people. And now you say, I want to be one. I love Josh's devotional for the Lord's Supper. We get a seat at the table. We get to be part of family. And maybe today's your time to say, I, I want that. I want to be an heir with Christ. I want to be adopted as a child of God. You can do that. When you repent of your sins and confess your faith in Jesus as the Son of God, you can be baptized to have those sins washed away. God adopts you as his child. He adds you to his church. It's, it's the most amazing blessing we get this side of heaven. And Maybe today it's time for you to do that. Or maybe we are talking about rebuilding. You say, you know what, I, I made that commitment. I pledged my life to Jesus. I became a Christian. You can remember the day you got baptized, but, but you also remember the day things went off the track. You can remember the times when life came crashing down and you realize, I've been building on things other than Jesus, and today I, I need to rebuild. I need to refocus. And what I need to do is just repent and come back. I need those times of refreshing that Peter promises us. I, I need to build my life on Jesus Christ and I need to get my focus back on that commitment I made when I became a Christian. And we would love nothing more than to celebrate along with the angels in heaven. If you need to come to the Lord or come back to him, why don't you come right now as we stand and sing. Christ the Lord is
Let us pray. God and Father in heaven, we're thankful that we've been able to be together here this morning to worship you, and we pray that all that's been said and done has been in accordance with your word. We're mindful of those who are not with us, and we pray that they will be able to worship online and that you just help us all to, to find new ways to stay focused on you and, and that we can all remain faithful and, and somehow we can get through this this virus and, and be able to get back to a normal way as we know it. But help us to to remain focused on you and to still be alert to to sharing your word with others and, and to doing good deeds. We're so thankful for the blessings we have in Christ. We thankful that he was willing to die on the cross as our sacrifice. And we just pray that we'll be able to have a home with you in heaven when this life is over. We want to be mindful of those who've lost loved ones. Pray that you'll, they'll be comforted. And just pray that you'll go with us and continue to bless us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.